Good evening, church. Hope everyone's had a great week so far. You know, it's kind of a short week. If you had Monday off, you know, I just believe that this is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And we're going to jump straight into the Word of God today. We're talking about the mo lessons we can learn from Moses. And I believe that there's there's three things that God put on my heart to to deal with us about in Moses' life that we can learn from. And and those three things are humility, how to trust God, and how to control our anger. You know, why anger? I, I don't know. That's what God told me to do. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Not today. But anyway, I believe that Today we're going to talk about the first thing on, on the list that I think is important for us is, is humility. How can we learn real humility and what real humility looks like? And I believe that we can learn that from Moses. That's one of the greatest attributes that most people glean from the life of Moses is, is how humble he was. Because you got to remember, Moses was a prince of Egypt, which is a world leadership role, which is, you know, he was at the pinnacle of, of that. He was, he was the prince of, of Egypt. He was over millions of people, not just the slaves, even the people in the, in the Egyptian kingdom. Moses was, was highly ranked in that. And then he went from being highly ranked there to being highly ranked in the Hebrew community. He was the leader of, of, a, of a whole nation. You know, there was nobody greater at that time than Moses. And in, in that when, when God delivered his people and set them free, they had a leader and his name was Moses. And so, so to understand why people say Moses was, was humble and, and, and humility was, was one of his great, greatest characteristics is because of where he came from and who he was and who he became. And so to understand how, how he got where he was, then we got to understand how he got there. You know, he didn't get there because he was arrogant and brash and, and just, you know, Hey, I'm going to do this all on my own. No, he got there through, through being humble and, and not thinking more of himself than he should have. Anyway, that's what we're going to kind of hit, hit in tonight and get into. And, and so hopefully you guys will get something out of this tonight and it will minister to you and it will take you to a new place with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for your people. Father, I thank you that as we open your word, Father, that you would minister grace and mercy and peace to us, Father, that you will teach us the things we need in this life to be successful, to be men and women that are looked upon as, as as good men and women of God that people will will call upon when they are in time of trouble because they can trust the God that's on the inside of us. And Father, I thank you that you said if you don't if you don't chasten us, then we're not even sons or daughters. So Father, I thank you that as the word goes forth, Father, that if it if it corrects us, Father, we'll we will enhance it. We will embrace it. We will we will we will accept it. Father, if it just encourages us, Father, then we will be encouraged, Father. And I just thank you, Father, as the word goes forth to your people, Father, that it will minister mercy and grace and peace to them. And Father, I just ask that you move my thoughts out of the way. And Father, you use your servant to do your will and to do your bidding. And Father, I surrender and I sur submit myself to you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. If you will go with me to, to Numbers chapter 12, we're going to, we're going to read out of Numbers, you know, Exodus, the life of Moses is, is, is a intriguing story. And, and it, it talks about the spiritual and the practical steps that happen in humil humility, you know, because there's some, some practical things that we can do to humble ourselves and then there's some spiritual things that we can do to humble ourselves but the, at the end of this see I believe this the way up with God is down the way up with God is down 
when we bow our knees and we get on our face and, and we we become low, God lifts us up. I would rather be raised up by God than raised up by men. And, and that's just the opposite of, of what we see in society today. People care more about what men think than they care about what the word of God says, which is God speaking. This is, this is God speaking. He's talking. This word is alive. It's not just a book. It's just not words written on, on a page. This word is alive. It, it, it can cause things to happen in this realm and the other realm. See, it, it's a book that is not just a book. These are the actual words of God spoken through men and women that, that were humble enough to allow God to use them to write this word of God. You know, and I, I know there's people out there that know that, oh, well, you know, men wrote this. Well, yes, men did write it, but they wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God put this together. No man could put a book like this together and it all meshed together. There's no contradictions. There's no no inaccuracies in, in this. Everything in this is, is true and accurate. Men have tried to disprove this word for hundreds of thousands of years trying to to disprove this you know to to pr disprove that this is the word of god that this has power that they've tried to disprove it but they can't because it's god speaking and god said i'm not a man that i can lie i always tell the truth everything in this word is true so go with me to numbers chapter 12 Verse 1, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. The Lord heard it. Sounds real humble, don't it? Now the man, now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Moses was the most humble man on the earth at this time. That's what it says right here. Verse 3. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. How did Moses get humble? We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Keep reading. Suddenly the Lord said to, said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three, three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark saying, and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against him, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from, the, from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there, there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly, in which we have which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead, whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, If her father had, had, had but spit in her face, would, would she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and afterwards she may be received again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not journey till Miriam was brought brought in again. And afterward, the people moved from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. What I want you to see, I want to call your attention right now to, to verse 3. I want you to look at verse 3. Now Moses was very humble more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Moses was humble. 
It didn't say the Lord humbled Moses. It says, now the man, Moses. See, God, God emphasized the man because he wanted us to know that this wasn't a spiritual thing. This was Moses, the natural man. This is Will, the natural man. Who we are when we're born and we walk in this flesh, fleshly body. God's speaking about that man. He said, in verse 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very humble. How did Moses get to be so humble? You got to remember, at this point right here, they've already come through the Red Sea. They've all already seen the 10 miracles in Egypt. They 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 went through they went through a whole lot of stuff. They 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 walked through on dry dry ground. They got manna at night. They got heated in the in the cold of the desert. He would light a fire by the pillar of fire would come at night so that they would all be warm. A million plus people. They'd seen miracle after miracle after miracle. You you think that would humble most men? <laughs> they weren't humble. It starts out, verse 1, they were upset. Now, you got to understand, let, let, me, let me paint this picture for you. Because Aaron and Miriam are Moses' big, big sister and big brother. They're both older than Moses. He, he's their younger brother. And Miriam is the one that put him in the basket and sent him off to be the king of Egypt. So, you know, Miriam is not humble. She's the opposite of, of what it says about Moses in verse 3. No, she's very haughty. She's very, you know, hey, dude, you wouldn't even be doing all this if it wasn't for me. If I wouldn't have pushed you in that basket over to the, to the princess so that she could pull you out of the Nile, you'd have been crocodile bait. So you owe me. You owe me for your life, Moses. And and you're going to go marry some Ethiopian woman? Did you get my permission to marry that Ethiopian woman? This is what this is what's going on in this this little first part of chapter 12. Now Aaron, you know, you know, most theologians believe this. Miriam had a Jezebel spirit. Because she was she was operating under a Jezebel spirit. She was running things. She was in charge. Moses was the was the prophet of the people and the leader of the people. And Aaron was the high priest. But Miriam ran things. Or she thought. And so, you know, she's upset because Moses took him an Ethiopian wife. I mean, and let's be real about it, you know. Moses was a Hebrew. An Ethiopian was probably my color. I don't know how many how many Caucasian Ethiopians you've ever seen. So see, interracial marriage has been around forever. And it's always been, been an issue for people. It's not like it just started with, you know, the 20th century, you know. It, it's always been an issue. It's always been around, and that's not something I even want to discuss. But Miriam had a problem. See, Miriam wasn't humble. Moses was humble. Mo Moses, how did Moses get to be where he is? Because he was humble. See, if anybody out of out of these three men, these three people right here, Miriam. Aaron and Moses, only one of them had a real reason to be arrogant and haughty, and that's Moses. He was the prince of Egypt, and now he's the leader of the Christian world at this moment. He's the leader of the Hebrew people. God was only called to that one group of people at this time. Nobody else had a right to call upon the name of God. Nobody even knew who God was. 
other than what they had seen through the Hebrew nation, what they had seen through through hearing about the Egyptian plight. Because trust me, when when Moses took those million plus people, almost two million with women and children, out of Egypt and into the desert, the people in that region they heard these people are coming to our land. And they have a God that is awesome. They heard about the splitting of the Red Sea and all the Roman, all the Egyptian soldiers dying in the in the in the ocean and them walking across on dry land. They heard about the the ten miracles that happened in, in Egypt with the death of the of the firstborn of all of Egypt dying, including Pharaoh's son. They heard about these things. So they heard about these people as they were coming out. You know, and Aaron and Miriam were haughty and thought, you know, hey, Moses is the leader, but we control what he do. So really, we're the leader, and Miriam especially. See, I, I always ask, and, and I, I, I study this out, and I'm like, okay, why didn't Aaron get leprosy? I mean, he was a part of this, this thing. Look, look. Verse 1, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. It didn't say Miriam spoke against Moses. It said Miriam and Aaron. But then if you if you drop all down, then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud in verse 5 and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. And then he said, hear now my words. See, I want you to see this. Who did the Lord call first? Aaron. Because Aaron was the high priest. Aaron should have been in charge. He should have put Miriam in her place. When, when God came into the garden, who did he call first? Adam. Where are you? He didn't say Eve. Where are you? Then God said, verse 6, then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. Basically, this is what God is speaking to Aaron and, Aaron and Miriam. He said, if you're a prophet, I would have spoke to you in a vision. I would have made myself known to you in a vision. So that tells me they weren't a prophet because they hadn't had no vision because God hadn't spoken to them. Not so with Moses. So, so now God is, God is justifying something to the people of God right now. He, and he, he's making a statement to us today. The way up with me is down. Moses didn't ask for, for all of this from God. Moses didn't ask for this. See, if, if we are going to get from God what we need from God, then we're going to have to humble ourselves. God won't humble you. God will allow you to stay just like you are. He'll allow you to be haughty, but life will humble you. Because when the presence of God lifts off of your life and, and God isn't ministering to you, you'll become leprous like with Miriam. Even so, he is faithful in all my house. He is faithful in all my house. See, it's not just about the humbleness. It's not just about humility. It's about humility and faithfulness. Because what does he what does he say? He says, "Not so." With, in verse seven, he said, "Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly." And this is what it, this is what God is saying. I don't speak to him in 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 parables. 
you know, I don't speak to him to where he can't understand me. I don't speak to him where he has to tell. And I wonder what God really meant about that. No, God said, I speak to him plainly. And I tell him exactly. When he, when he, when Moses, uh, uh, go, go with me to chapter, chapter three of Exodus. I, I want to show you something. Why God chose Moses. Verse, verse 1 in chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back, back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he, he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near, near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in, in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the, of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Pezzites and the Hevitites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then, then the Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, and, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus say, you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you, sh you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have, and I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of, of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Pezzarites and a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will they then they will heed your voice and you shall come and the elders of Israel to the king of Egypt and and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I am sure the king of Egypt will not let you go, not even by a, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst and after, and he will let you go. Hallelujah. So God, God began in, in Exodus chapter 3, Moses' encounter with God. What was the first thing that happened? He told him, this is holy ground. See, when you're, when you're humble, see, m most people in that situation, the first thing they would have wanted to do is they wanted to see God. But Moses recognized, this is greater than me. He wouldn't look upon the face of God. He, he, he bowed his head and he bowed his knees. And God told him to take his sandals off because the ground that he was standing on was holy ground. See, 
the first phase of humility is that when you recognize that God is bigger than you. See, Moses, Moses could have been totally different. He was raised differently. He was raised differently. He was raised to be a king. He wasn't raised to bow to other people. He was used to being bowed to. When Moses walked into a room in Egypt, men would bow to him and they would respect him. And I believe that's one of the reasons that he was able to understand the authority that God had over him because he he was raised in authority. He was raised as a prince of Egypt. He understood that God was bigger than him, that God, did, God required the respect of him. See, most people, you know, even today we live in a society that that we don't respect authority. We don't respect our parents. We don't respect our teachers. We don't respect our, our police officers. We don't respect our president. We don't respect anybody in authority because we feel like, hey, I, I'm just as important as those people. And, and maybe you are. But see, God said that if, if you exalt yourself, guess what? Then you have to maintain yourself. If you want to put yourself on a pedestal and you want to you want to you want to do these things, then you're in charge of your own life. Then you have to be the person that steps up. See, I believe this that when you're have true humility, you don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to explain it to anybody. You don't have to say, "Oh well, false humility says it." Oh, who? I'm, I'm just nobody. I mean, who am I? I'm not anybody special. That's not, that's not, that's not real humility. That's a false humility. That's a humility that really says, you know, yeah, I really do think I am somebody. But I don't want you to think that I think I'm somebody. See, for me, I mean, I believe this. If you have to tell people you're in authority, then you're not in authority. Moses didn't have to tell everybody he was the leader. He didn't go to he didn't go to Aaron and, and Miriam and say, Hey man, what are y'all doing, man? I'm in charge. You know? He he didn't even get back in, in their face when they were telling him, you know, who do you think you are? And then you go off and marry this this foreign woman. Who do you think you are? I used to change your diapers. That's what Miriam was basically saying to Moses. Who do you think you are? But see, when you're when you have true humility, you don't have to speak for yourself. Because we see in this text here, and nowhere around this text, if you read all the other scriptures around this, because I believe you can't just take something and make it stand out. All this stuff fits together and it tells the whole story. But you can't find anywhere in the, in the surrounding story, stories or anything where Moses fought back, that he lashed back at them and said, you know what? I mean, I'm in charge. I didn't see you standing there with your hands up in the, in the, the Red Sea split. I didn't see you call down hell and fire from, from, from a clear sky. You know, I didn't see you you know, call forth the death angel and, and it and it come into all of Egypt and, and, and kill all the firstborn of, of all of Egypt. I didn't see you do that. I didn't see you go up on the mountain and get the Ten Commandments. I didn't see you talk to God face to face. God hasn't talked to you face to face. No, you can't find that anywhere in here. Moses didn't do any of those things. You see, when you're truly humble, God will back you up. Verse 6, hear now my words. He didn't say hear Moses. He said, hear now my words. He called, he, understand this. I want you to get this picture. When God called them out and, and he put them in, everybody heard. When God, when he, when he came down in that cloud and he said, Aaron, 
Miriam, Moses, get to the tabernacle meeting because we, we're about to have a conversation. We're about to have a talk. We're about to straighten some things out. And I guarantee you, all the people that were around, all the other priests and all the other people that were working in the church, you know what they did? They backed up against the wall. And they said, whoa, Miriam is in trouble. Moses is in trouble. Aaron is in trouble. And when they stood there, and then God said, all right, now hear my, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He said, if there's a prophet among you, so this tells me that Moses was bigger than a prophet. Because he said, Moses is bigger than just a prophet. He said, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face. Even plainly. He said, not only do I talk to Moses face to face, I don't have no go between. I don't, I don't have no, you know, smoking ephod and, you know, candles and all the incense and all the stuff that the high priest had to take in to get God's presence to, to show up. He said, I don't talk to Moses that way. Me and him talk face to face. And I talk very plainly to him, like I'm talking to you this evening, Moses, and God talk that way. And he sees the form of the Lord. Basically what he said to him is, and he sees me face to face. Moses has seen me. He knows what I look like. And then he went on to, to do some other things. And so, so what I want us to, to hear tonight and, and to get from this message tonight is that true humility doesn't need to speak humility. Your life will speak it. God will speak it over you. When you're a true, humble person from God, when, hum, when your hum, hum, humility comes from God, and it's genuine, you don't have to tell anybody. God will testify of you because that's what he did right here. And, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you this prophetically, those that are speaking against the servants of God that are true servants of God, leprosy is coming your way because God is not mocked. And what he did for Moses, he said, when I find someone like Moses, when I find someone that's humble enough to allow me to use their life, I'll back them up. But see, this I want you to get this. Because this is this is what really made, this is what solidified Moses right here. Verse 13. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, O God, I pray. Do you get that? Moses, in verse 13, his sister, he loved her. Even when she was being a total butt, disrespecting him and his wife, disrespecting his ministry, disrespecting him as the man of God. This is what Moses did. He cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, O oh God, I pray. God wasn't going to heal her, but because he had respect for Moses, because Moses was a humble man, you know, 10 times in the wilderness, Moses stood in the gap for these people. 10 times. And after the 10th time, God told Moses, get out of the way. I'm going to destroy them all. 
And Moses still pleaded for their life. And God said, okay, but not one man over the age of 20 will go into the promised land. They are all going to get exactly what they kept saying. They're going to die in this wilderness. You know how many, how much, that's real humility. Jesus, what did he say when he was hanging on the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. See, if we're going to be humble men and women, then we have to understand that it may cost you something. It may cost you something. In Luke 14, 11, Jesus set forth this powerful principle of life. He, he forever exalts himself. Whoever, I'm sorry, whoever exalts himself will be humble. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus said this in Luke 14, 11. He said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. He didn't say God would humble them. He said, whoever exalts himself will be humble. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know why? Because God looks at every aspect of our life. Everything that we do, God looks at our heart and our heart motive. That's why God could say about David, he was a man after his heart. David's action didn't always line up. He didn't always line up. But his heart was always aligned with God. And God looks at the inner man. He, look, he looks at, show me a great man, and I'll show you a man that's probably humble that knows that when he looks in the mirror, I'm only where I am is because of God. That I'm only doing what I'm doing because God's honored me and God has allowed me. You know, I, I, I believe this and, and understand me on this. The very breath you breathe, you should be thankful to God because he is the life giver. Everything we have on this earth is given to us from God and because of God. And so I, I, I believe that if we are going to be totally humble and, and walk in humility all the days of our life, then we have to look in the mirror and we have to make a decision. Is God in charge or am I in charge? And if you're in charge, then you're not humble. If God's in charge, then you'll humble yourself and you'll you'll put yourself where you're supposed to be. Moses could have been, he, he could have been way up here. He could have been, he could have been probably the worst leader to ever lead Israel, but he was the greatest leader to lead Israel because he was humble. Because he understood that there was nothing he could do without Christ. There was nothing he could not do without the without God. Without God's presence, without God's spirit, there was nothing he could do. He said in, in one of his dissertations with God, he told God, he said, God, if your presence doesn't go, we're not leaving. When God told him to get up and get it to the promised land, and he said, Lord, if your presence doesn't go, we're not going. He said, you know, they may all take off, but I'm not going anywhere without you, God. See, when we're really humble and we really put ourselves in the place of God, God will give you everything you need. You believe in God for healing in your body? Humble yourself. Humble yourself and get down on your face and say, God, forgive me. Heal me. Set me free. See, most of us, we're not willing to do that. We, we expect God to do something for us because, well, you know, my last name is Christian. 
God, you're supposed to take care of me. No, God takes care of his word. He takes care of this word. He takes care of what he wrote in this word. Now, if you line up with this word and you get this word on the inside of you and you're speaking like God speaks, then God will honor you. But I'm telling you, if you don't hear anything else from me tonight, hear this. The way up with God is down. If you humble yourself, God will exalt you. Look at Moses' life. He went from being the prince to a slave to a heathen because when he he met the median when he when he met those those women at the well they were not godly men and women even though they were living under the mountain of god they were not godly people they they were they were <laughs> they were idol makers they they worshiped all kinds of things But through his life, God began to show Moses. And Moses was humble enough to put himself at the bottom. Because trust me, when he stood at that well, those women knew that he, he, he didn't look like the regular Joe. You know, chances are he probably still had the little tassel thing that he wore. I mean, he still acted like a, an Egyptian because that was all he knew. Even though he had figured out, I, and you know, we don't know exactly when he figured out that he was a Hebrew. You know, because the story doesn't give us timelines and, you know, but he went from a boy to a man, to a murderer, to a prophet of God. And in between that process, He had to humble himself and he had to give himself to God. He had to allow God to use him. You know, even at the at the burning bush experience, he started making excuses. I stutter. I don't have good speech. I can't do this. I can't do that. You know, that was all false humility. That wasn't real humility. That was false humility. He was trying to get out of doing something. You know, he was trying to get out of doing what God had called him to do. Now to say that you can't do something and to to feel, you know, there's there's you gotta understand Moses was built for greatness. He was he was a prince of Egypt. He was raised in the finest schools, he was taught the finest things. So he wasn't an you know, he had a speech impediment, as they say, but I think he used it as an excuse because he, he must have learned how to manage it in Egypt. But anyway, so I'm going to stop there, and next week we'll I'll finish up. I have a few more things I want to say, but I'm going to stop here, and, and I'll come back next week and finish this up and then get into the next phase of what I want to talk about, lessons we can learn from Moses. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your people. Father, I thank you that you begin to show us that if we will humble ourselves, if we will we will put down our idols and put down our thoughts and our ideals that you will exalt us in due season. Father, that the timetable that you put us on, it's not, it's not just an ordinary thing. And Father, I thank you that your people that are listening by, by, their, by the word of the Lord, Father, that you would bless them. And Father, that you would show them that the true way up with you is down. And Father, that if they will just humble themselves and if they will they will repent and ask you, Father, that you would give them the desires of their heart, that you would bless them above what they can think or imagine. And Father, I just thank you for those that are that are struggling in their in their health. Father, I speak healing over their bodies, Father, over their minds, over their emotions. Father, I thank you that what the enemy has meant to destroy your people. Father, you have meant to turn it for their good because of their ability to humble themselves, Father, so that they can see the hand of God. And Father, I thank you that every person under the sound of my voice, Father, if they have need, whether it be financial, physical, emotional, spiritual, Father, that you would meet every need for your people this evening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I hope you got some good stuff out of that. I feel like I kind of stumbled around a little bit. And, you know, one thing that I, I, I do know is that 
when you when you minister prophetically, when you're a prophetic minister, God is always talking. And when you're trying to teach and, and teach prophetically and, and teach the the literal word of God, it, it can get whoo big. And, and so so I, I just believe that the things that God wanted to say, he got said tonight. And if you have need in your life and you need us to pray with you, you can you know, always reach us. And we're having church every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. You're welcome to come and join us if you, if you don't have somewhere to go and, and worship. Because I know there's lots of churches that are still just online and, and nothing wrong with that. And I'm not trying to solicit anybody's church so don't 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 think that i'm just saying if you need somewhere to come and 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 be a part of a physical church that people can touch you and and pray for you and lay hands on you we're open and and we're open for business and we're doing business for god and i just believe that everything that god does he does in excellence so I just wanted to invite you, if you need a church and you don't have a church, you're, we're here at Answer to Life. We accept all people. We we believe that no one is insignificant in, in the body of Christ. Everybody is important. So you guys have a blessed rest of your week, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. And if I don't, I'll see you next Wednesday here again, and we'll continue with the lessons that we can learn from Mother's. You guys have a great week. Good night.